Welcome, everyone. Today, we are very pleased that Tom Van Winkle, president of the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust, is joining us. Thanks, Tom, for being with us today. I appreciate you having me. To begin, please tell us about yourself, where you grew up, schools, profession, that kind of thing. Well, actually, I grew up in New Jersey, and uh, I moved to Virginia 25 years ago. I was working for General Motors as a field consultant and dealer auditor, and they said, how would you like to move to Virginia? And I said, sure. I said, where? They said, we don't care. So I wound up in Spotsylvania, Virginia, living on the wilderness battlefield. <laughs> um, I've always had a passion for, for military. Um, my grandfather fought in World War II on a destroyer escort and was uh, caught up in Hal Halsey's Typhoon, who many people know about. Um, my uncle was in D-Day, D-Day plus 18. He was an engineer in a tank corps and had, had a lot to do with the rakes that were put on the front of the tanks to go through the hedgerows. So I always had an interest in military. But when I moved to Spotsylvania and I wound up on the wilderness battlefield, um, obviously the Civil War came into play because um, I'm sitting right in the middle of it. So like anything else in my life, it wound up being an obsession. And um, in the subdivision I happened to move into, um, about a month or two into moving here, in the newsletter there was a little ad that a uh, an individual in the subdivision was trying to put a friends group together to the National Park Service to aid in preserving the wilderness battlefield. So I thought I'd go, not knowing what I got into. And uh, we wound up founding the Friends of Wilderness Battlefield back in about 1996. Um, and we worked very diligently to work on the battlefield to get it known, um, to get it in shape, we worked on trenches, fences, all that type of thing and promotion of it with the Park Service. And one thing led to another, and I wound up being president of that group for five years. Like, like they say, never miss a meeting. You never know what'll happen. <laughs> and then the, the day job got a little bit uh, dicey where I had to travel all over the country. So traveling uh, precluded my presidency and I had to uh, step away from it for a year or two. And uh, I did, uh, reluctantly, but the traveling at least gave me excuses to stop at other battlefields all over the country which I always, my bosses never picked up on the fact that my hotels were near battlefields, but uh, that, that worked out well. And then one day I happened to go to a book signing in Fredericksburg and the current president of the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust, though I knew very well, asked me a very prompt, pertinent question. He says, what are you doing? And I happened to say nothing. So the next thing I know, I was on the board of the Central Virginia Battlefields Trust as the communications director, building their website and doing outreach programs and PR for several years, I think about 10, if I recall. And then uh, I got asked to go to lunch with the president and the vice president. And um, that was, they asked me if I would take over as president as he was retiring. And uh, so for the past, I think it's five years now, I've been uh, doing my best to run the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust. And uh, that's kind of how everything happened. <laughs> All right, so it's uh, it's quite a uh, quite a, a journey that you have been on. So so you got involved with the uh, with the trust by uh, by doing social media, website, and and marketing kind of stuff. How how does that work out for you? Uh, it, it worked out very well. Um, at the time, we had somebody running the website that lived in Florida. And um, the website wasn't updated much, if, if any at all. It's a difficult, at that time it was difficult to try to get, you know, if you live in Florida, you're not normally aware of what's going on in Fredericksburg in real time. So there's a big lag. So we built a new website and got everything updated, you know, more and more um, daily almost. Um, part of what I was doing with, with GM too was building different social media platforms. So. We kind of brought CVBT into what I call the 20th century at that time. So, I mean, you know, if you leave a website alone, people will look at it for so long and then they're not coming back. So we had to change all of that. Um, and for the group, it worked out great because we were able to show them what we were doing um, as we were doing it rather than doing something and nobody knowing about it. CVBT, when we started, was sort of a, 
I want to almost say a black ops operation. We, want, we wanted to do things, but we weren't really tooting our own horn, I guess is what I was saying. And by not doing that, we were kind of missing out on uh, donations, income, or anybody even know that we were there to begin with. So we had to change that and let everybody know, hey, we are here and we are doing this. So that was really the big change that, that I got involved with in it so that we were more known um, in the community and, and as it turns out, well, pretty much the country and even to England now. So That's right. You know, several years ago, I, I did an audit of the Facebook and, and uh, it was being changed like every two or three weeks. You know, the, the posts weren't, um, weren't uh, forthcoming, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what exactly is the mission of uh, CBBT? Well, our, our actual motto from the very beginning is uh, saving dirt and grass. That's our motto. But our actual mission statement is to protect and preserve the lands on the four major battlefields here, which would be Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Wilderness, and Spotsylvania Courthouse. Uh, that's our area of operation, and that's where we stick. Not that we haven't helped out other organizations in different places, um, we had helped out Civil War Trust, now the ABT, a couple of years back when they were trying to get Brandy Station taken care of Fleetwood Hill. We we got a grant for 700000 for them. Um, also, we helped out the trust when they bought uh, Slaughter Pen Farm. They weren't going to do it. Their board had decided they weren't going to do it because that was, well, it still stands as the most expensive battlefield ever purchased at $12 million. But we pledged them a million. And they changed their mind because a million for us, we're not a big group. A million for us is a lot of money, but we paid them a million dollars. So we, we do work in this area, but if, if we can help in something connected, we certainly do. Um, given an unlimited amount of money, we'd do a lot more, but that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, I got that. So how many uh, full-time employees does the uh, trust have? We have two. We have a full-time executive director and a full-time assistant to the executive director. Um, and that's only been for the past four or five years. Um, basically, the board is all volunteer. Basically, before that, everything was volunteer. But as you accumulate land, you also accumulate compliance issues and tax issues and every other issue. And you have to have somebody there working on that all the time. So that's when we needed to get somebody in there full-time. We have a fairly large office in Fredericksburg. Luckily, one of our board members owns it and he leases it to us for an extremely embarrassing amount. So we actually have offices with very little overhead, so to speak. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that. Prior to that, we worked literally out of a storage room. We had a phone in a storage room that transferred calls to our volunteer executive director to his house. That's how we started and, and operated for years. But um, like again, we've saved a little over 1,350 acres on 40 properties, and you can imagine the, uh, the you know the compliance and the upkeep and everything else that has to go along with it. So, but we have a very low overhead, so and we keep it that way. Yeah, that's that's really a good idea. So uh, there are geographic boundaries, but uh, but you will assist others. If, if the uh, situation is within our, you know, it doesn't have to be, in other words, we can't go out and we can't do what the ABT does. We're not national. We're, we're extremely local. But like if the ABT calls us up and says, hey, we have a grant available, but we can't get it. Um, you know, we've got too many grants. They don't want to give it to us. Would you apply and help us out? We'll do things like that. Wow. Um, you know, we'll help out as best we can. But as far as purchasing battlefield we try to stay within the uh, geographic boundaries we have, although we, you know, we will help out where we can. Uh, but again, the problem is, you know, we have so much land here that needs attention. Um, the dollars just kind of are short of spreading it out, let's put it that way. So I know that there must be a lot of evaluative steps to prioritize potential properties. Is that right? Exactly. We, uh, we have a, a, a property list listed in, in uh, order of priority. Unfortunately, they don't come up for sale in that order. <laughs> in a perfect world, they would, but they don't. And, and uh, 
you know, we try to, our number one thing is to save battle soap ground, hallowed ground as they call it. I don't use the word hallowed too much anymore because it's been spread around and, and def definition has kind of lost its luster for me, but important ground where battles have taken place and, and what I call the so what factor, right? You save that piece of ground, what happened there, so what? Uh, it needs to mean something. Um, so we, we looked at that, but through the years, we've had to change a little because other properties come up that if not purchased would ruin the view shed or the total reason why you purchase an adjoining property. You know, you, know, you have, might have got 51 acres here and somebody wants to put up an amphitheater right next to it. And so you have to kind of spread out and go, okay, in order to keep the integrity of the property we bought, we have to now buy this. And that happens more often than not lately. Wow. Um, so I, I know that there were um, uh, several fights in the Chancellorsville area. Was it a Walmart or, or something of that nature? Yeah, Walmart. Um, we, we can call that a, another battle, sure. Um, what, <laughs> happened, what happened with that, the Civil War Trust at the time, now ABT and the Friends of Wilderness Battlefield and a few other organizations uh, took Walmart to court. Um, if you look at those documents, you'll see conspicuously CBBT's name is not on them. What we actually did is Walmart was going to be on the corner of the intersection of what's called Gateway to the Wilderness, which is Route 20, which is a wartime arms turnpike, and then the Plank Road. They were going to put up on a corner there. So what we did was instead of going the route of, of legalities, we bought, the, we bought the adjacent corner. We bought 99 acres on the other side and showed them that we're, we mean business and you know we're gonna pick up all this land around you because usually when Walmart comes in, all the ancillary stores come in and they spread out. Well, we were gonna stop that before it happened. Um, and as we all know, it, it, Walmart finally graciously decided to move a mile down the road and they're doing just fine where they could have been in the first place. But yeah, that was a big one here. Um, they also tried to do that in Fredericksburg by George Washington's home and ferry farm years ago. And they got chased out of there and they're literally a, um, another mile down the road there and doing fine. So I, I never could understand why that issue didn't start a mile down the road where they end up anyway. Yeah, got that. <laughs> so uh, are you ever surprised about the availability of some properties? Surprised of the availability? I'm more yeah. surprised of the non-availability of it. Uh -huh. um, Pretty much, we're you know we're dead center between Washington D.C. and Richmond, as you know. So actually, for the same exact reasons as the armies fought here four times in, in the Civil War, is why the property here is so worth um, getting is because it's we're basically a bedroom area for Washington D.C. and Richmond. Right. So our location, in a way, works against us um, because everybody's trying to get here. So. It's difficult to get a property. Um, what I do like is we do have several families that have been here since the Civil War or before. And we love getting the phone call saying, hey, you know, we need to move out or so-and-so has passed away and we don't want our property developed. Are you interested? Those are the easy ones. Yeah. Uh, the hard ones are the ones that come up for sale and there's four siblings involved and of course none of them agree on anything. Mm. Um, those are the ones that can last a year or two years. And we're constantly working on properties um, that we can't announce because we're still trying to work them out. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, but we are trying to, we have a plan, a method to our madness. Like right now we're working, we've done a lot in Spotsylvania, but we're also working on the Chancellorsville, um, on Jackson's flank attack. I've been, I unfortunately went on record to say that before I leave the, the uh, CBBT, I want to be able to walk a distance of that flank attack without having to skip over a house. And we're pecking away at it and we're getting pretty close. <laughs> wow. So those type of things are gratifying to try to do. So, so when a, a historic property does become available uh, for purchase, what are the steps involved? Well, first we vet the property. Luckily on our board of directors, we've got a couple of well-known historians um, who, who are you know, very adept at vetting what happened there. Um, we decide, is it something that's within the uh, core battlefield boundaries? Because um, that 
will give you a lot of in, a lot of uh, ideas whether or not you may get a grant for it or not. Um, we'll also look at it and say, hey, is it within the park's boundaries? Can we turn that over to the park? Um, we're a land trust. We don't really want to own this land forever. We'd rather turn it over to the park service or the county with an easement or something of that nature. So we vet it that way. And then, of course, we vet how much do they want for it and can we afford it? And if a couple of those good boxes get checked off, especially ones where we can get a grant, we will make offers, we'll bid on it, we'll work with the family on it, and uh, hopefully obtain it. But not every property ticks off all the boxes. You know, a lot of people think, you know, because this particular regiment walked across my property needs to be saved. And I always say in Virginia, you know, you could put a fence around Virginia and call it historic because it is, you know, you can't save everything nor should you. But uh, we go after the ones that there was a, a battle on, something happened on, something uh, changed, the war changed because of, uh, things like that, because it's, it goes back to the so what thing. If you bring people on the property and say, yeah, they camped here for two nights, <laughs> okay, um, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, you, you want to have a story to tell. That, that and, will make sense. Exactly. And we're also telling the, stol the soldier stories. I mean, it's the individual soldiers. Every one of them has a story. Um, and, and as a friend of mine um, always says, is, you know, these, these pieces of battlefield, you're, you're basically walking on cemeteries. Um, there are interred there. There's, there's no way every, every soldier that was ever killed and buried in battle have been reinterred. You're working, we're walking on cemeteries. You're walking on um, outdoor classrooms. You can call it whatever you want, but you got to have, like you say, a story to it that that makes a difference. That if I stand here and I tell the story, you're going to understand something important. Right. So I, I know that uh, when when current projects are discussed uh, publicly, that the price is uh, usually escalated a bit, and <laughs> and and so how how do you go about getting project specific uh, funding? Is, is it a lot of grants or, or a lot of uh, individual donations? It's a lot of both. Uh, it depends basically on the cost of the project we're working on. Um, for instance, just we just bought Myers Hill on the Spotsylvania battlefield. That was on the 14th, was in the tail end of the battle. That's where Meade was almost captured. A story that most people don't know because they jumped from one the last portion of what they think is Spotsylvania and they move on and they forget all about that. That was a $450,000 investment. Um, luckily we were able to arrange with the landowner where he's holding the, the mortgage on it and he's given us some pretty good terms. So that one was in the core battlefield area. It had an important story to tell. So that one we were able to get two grants for. We got a $196,000 grant from the Virginia Battlefield Protection Fund. And what will be announced, and you're getting a heads up on this because we just got the, uh, the okay on it uh, two days ago, is the American Battlefield Protection Program has given us over $200,000 grant for it. So you're, we're pretty close to being $50,000 away from, from paying it off. And that's gonna come, it has come and is still coming from, I call members what I call, I don't call members, I call them partners, because as far as I'm concerned, if you give money for, to us for battlefield preservation, you're our partner in saving it. You're just not a member getting a magazine, you're part of it. Right. So that's a way we do that. On some of the smaller ones, we can, so we can cover it with donations, um, but grants are a huge part of it. And, and right now in our current political environment, they're a little difficult, yeah. to say the least. Um, Grants have gone from probably a, a three-month process to at least a year process now with the bureaucracy that's now involved with them. Wow. So when you do buy something like this, you better have a down payment and be able to figure out it's going to take you a year to get a bulk of the money for it. Jeez. So, so turning a property over to the Park Service or to the county after purchase can be a, pro a prolonged process too. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, I'll give you two examples on the Park Service. Um, one of our early purchases was 99 acres on McClaw's Wedge, and that's on the Chancellorsville battlefield. 
Um, the park, I should preface it saying the park service is only able to purchase a property at the appraised value and no more. Nobody basically in their right mind will sell their property for appraised value. So what we do is we'll come in and we'll purchase that property at the best deal or appraised value. And then we'll sell it back to the park for what they are able to pay and we'll absorb the difference. Um, back to McClough's Wedge, we paid $450,000 for it. The park service was only allowed to pay up to 420, so we absorbed the other 30,000. So that's kind of how it works with the park service. Um, we just did Flint Jackson's flank attack. We we absorbed 66 thousand dollars on that turnover. So those type of things are the way it works with the park service. Now the county, it's um, usually we'll put an easement on it and turn it over to the county if they if they so want it, and then it just it's just protected by an easement. But that's kind of the, how that happens, and it doesn't happen overnight, especially with the federal government and the Park Service. Um, it takes quite a while. Um, you know, it could take a year or more to get uh, paid back <laughs> from the federal government. So again, you have to look way ahead of things and say, all right, can we afford to float $400,000 for six, 12 months or whatever it is. So um, it's doable, we have done it, we continue to do it, but it's a very slow process. Man. So I, I know that you've had uh, many success stories. Um, can you tell us about the, the highlights? Well, a lot of the highlights. Well, the, one of the highlights, and it was the, the one, I'll, I'll go back to Slaughter Penn Farm, where we uh, partnered with the American Battlefield Trust. Uh, the CVBT, we had been working on the owners of, of Slaughter Penn Farm for years before this, the uh, American Battlefield Trust got involved with it. And we had talks with them on and off with it. And what happened was that uh, the, the wife was talking to the adjoining airport owner and the airport owner somehow offended her. And she came back and told her husband, we will never sell this property to so-and-so at the airport. <laughs> Good for us. Yeah. Um, bad for us was somehow along the line, a real estate agent got involved and talked them into him said, I think we were talking around $3 million at the time. After this real estate agent got involved with it, it went uh, 10, 12,000, $12 million. And that's where the American Battlefield Trust came into it. Um, so that was the settled price was 12 million. But what a lot of people don't understand is behind these, these deals are some of the silliest reasons why they could go bad. And the big reason this one could have gone bad was all due to cats. I mean, the animal cats. Yeah. Um, the owner's wife had beloved barn cats, and I mean a lot of them, and she was extremely upset, wondering where these barn cats would go. And the deal almost fell through because we couldn't figure out what to tell her. Oh. But how we got her under, to understand that barn cats would be taken care of and all would be good. But honestly, there was discussion about the barn cats that could have led to a problem. So it's some of the things that happen behind the scenes or you wouldn't believe. But that particular one was, was near and dear to us because, again, for a small organization to put a million dollars together to convince a, a national organization this needs to be done um, was a terrific thing. Um, the, uh, the recent Myers Hill one is another great one because that's an untouched, pristine, intact battlefield, which is exceedingly rare to find. Um, it's the only thing, you know, it, the only thing it was, it's called Myers Hill because of John Meyer who used to live there and, and you know, that, not to make a long, make take a long story longer, but he was kind of a Wilbur McLean. He moved out of Fredericksburg, went into Spotsylvania to get rid of, away from the war. He wound up being in a Virginia regiment fighting at the Bloody Angle and watched his house on fire <laughs> up on the hill while he was fighting. So it was kind of a Wilbur McLean thing at the, but the entire battlefield is as is, as it was in 1864. So that's very hard to find. So we are, we're not done with that yet. There's other parts of it that we are pursuing. Um, but that is uh, in the long run going to be quite a nice track. Um, and we're gonna set it up very well for the public. But those are two of the ones that come to mind. I mean, we've got 40 properties and every one of them is special in some way. And I always tell everybody the most special one is the next one. So right. yeah. <laughs> So I, I know that CBBT is a membership organization. How many members do you have? Right now we have around 600. 
Um, there was a time where we had well over a thousand, but that was back in 1996 in the era of what I call the um, Ken Burns era. That's when you had the Ken Burns Civil War was out and then it was all the rage and everybody was interested in it. And, and it's in Civil War Trust and Central Virginia Battlefield Trust were brand new groups. Um, a friend and local um, park historian, retired park historian, Don Fons wrote that ever, ever so famous letter to Lighthizer to put these things together and it was all new. So everybody was extremely energized by it. But as time goes on and the economy does what it does, um, things fluctuate. And then of course, environments change, people's perspectives change, not always for the better. And so now we're down around 600, but it ticks up when we get a property and we announce the property, it'll tick up for a while. I'd like to have 1,500 or 2,000 to sustain what we want to do, but it's difficult. Um, it, we, we don't have the um, funding to send out hundreds of thousands of solicitation letters like other bigger organizations do. Um, we want to keep the majority of every penny we can get to buy in the dirt and grass. Um, so we're heavy on social media now. One of the, one of the employees I spoke about before, she is, a social media genius and she's done things for us that I could never think of doing so uh, we're getting there but um, basically without what I call members what I call partners you know we're sunk uh, you got to have interest you got to have people supporting us believing in what we do and support us all the time not just when there's a property up here I've got we've got a little overhead but a little overhead still has to be paid <laughs> yeah know? yeah so aside from the warm and fuzzy feeling uh, one gets from membership, are there any added uh, benefits like uh, on the front line? Well, it's funny you should have that. <laughs> <laughs> I have all that stuff. Yeah, we got the front line magazine, which is, which is fairly new. This will be our fourth edition. Um, we were putting out a, a newsletter that I kind of equated to a, um, something that needed to be in, in, uh, embellished upon. Um, we were, I don't know if you recognize these, these are the Fredericksburg then and now journals we've been publishing for about 14 years. Right. Um, actually, yeah, 14 years or so. And the, the interest in those went down because it's a very, I mean, it's Fredericksburg. I and mean, if you're in Fredericksburg, you're really interested. If you're outside of Fredericksburg, not so much. So what we did was we stopped publishing that and kind of moved the money towards the Frontline magazine, which everybody seems to appreciate because we can, we can tell people what we're doing more. Again, we've got authors in there that, that just love the right for us and everything. I, I try to scramble something together that people may or may not read. I don't know, but it's in there anyway. Um, so you get that. Um, I mean, you get what I call, I don't call trinkets and trash, but you get different things. You know, you get, you get mouse pads and buttons and pens and all that sort of stuff. And, but, um, you know, we try to give you things so that you can promote us. Um, the magazine is the most important to me because it's our, it's our imprint outreach. Um, we're very proud of it. Um, but again, you're partnering with us. I mean, if you're sending us $100, you, know, you can bet the majority of that's going into the dirt and grass. And you can say, you know, you can come up here and say, hey, I, I had a part in this. Um, because to me, history hasn't stopped. History's still being made. If we're saving these properties, and you're involved in it, you're, you're part of history, um, like it or not. Um, so I, I don't like, I wish I had no overhead. Um, you'll never see us with more than two employees, I'll guarantee you that. Um, if I got paid for my time, I could retire from my daytime job, but I, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, that's the nature of being involved and invested in what you do. Yeah, and and I know that, uh, that, that the, uh, assistant that you're talking about, Sarah, is a prolific writer. She is a um, prolific writer. Um, she writes for the ECW. She, you know, when she was in California, I'm sure you've seen her giving speeches all over the place. She, she just attended, uh, the ECW did a symposium yesterday, um, not yesterday, what is today? No, did a Saturday and she'll be on C-SPAN because C-SPAN was there recording it. So yeah, I mean, she's very well known and she adds a tremendous amount to this organization. And yeah, I thank her every day for everything she does. Oh boy. She's incredible. So, so I understand that you hold an annual conference. Uh, what happens there? 
Well, actually what we've done, we've held that now for 23 years. The first year we didn't think of it. Um, in fact, next year will be our 25th anniversary as an organization. So we're having a 21st or, uh, conference. Unfortunately, we had to cancel ours this year for obvious reasons. Um, next year is we're going to have ours outdoors anyway, in case anybody <laughs> still has any. Um, but what we do is we usually put on three days. And what we do is we have tours with well-known authors, uh, historians, and guides um, on the four battlefields. Uh, we've done things like the Lincoln, uh, done the Lincoln Trail from, you know, Washington, D.C. on down to Maryland. We've done different things. Um, we have a, a large dinner and gathering, usually on a Saturday night. And we'll have a keynote speaker doing something there of some of some interest. Um, we get together, we talk about what we do. We have, uh, I put on what I call the president's reception on a Friday night, which is very popular because it's free beer and wine. And, and as soon as the free comes in, everybody shows up. So it becomes very popular. Um, but we basically have three days of, of a lot of uh, fun, uh, a lot of education while we're having fun. And, um, you know, meeting with all our partners and, and getting to know them. I love putting faces with names. Uh, I love hearing ideas. Um, I, I, know I will always sit and listen to somebody who says, hey, why don't we do this? And, and more often than not, it's a great idea. So, uh, yeah, we'll be doing that next April. Um, we call it going back to our roots. We have been having it at a hotel facility. We'll still have rooms there, but this time we're going to go back on the battlefield under tents with hay bales and seats. And... Um, old barbecue because uh, in the very beginning our civil war was North Carolina versus Virginia barbecue so we're going to go back to that and uh, it'll be a lot of fun because uh, we've in fact that we're still around after 25 years and we're still doing what we're doing uh, I think is an amazing thing for a small group of people that just wanted to try to help out well I should say so Tom you you've been a real good sport what have I missed that you'd like our viewers to know about well, like, uh, what, like how to become a member? Well, just go on our website and, um, you know, empty your wallet. No, only kidding. You go on our website and you can sign up. You can see everything I just told you and more on cvbt.org. And um, you can see what we're doing, what we've done. Um, you know, I, it, a lot of people say to me, well, you know, I don't know if I want to donate or not. I'm just one person. But, you know, one person you add up a lot of one persons, and it makes a huge difference. Um, I love to have you as our, par as our partners, and um, it's uh, it's important. I, I, without getting into current events, it, you know, our history is important, and we can't erase it. We can't rewrite it. It's not always the most. It's not always the best of times. But I always say, as the Revolutionary War created this country, the Civil War formed it in one way or another. And it's important to understand where we came from and what these individuals gave up for what they believed in 155 or so years ago. And you need to look at it through the beliefs of 155 years ago, not today. Uh, things have changed. But it's important to be able to walk on the fields um, where these people gave the last full measure it's important, it's nice to read a book, and then it's great to walk out the door and stand on the battlefield and just close your eyes and imagine what they were going through at the time. Like I said, I'm sitting on the wilderness battlefield here, I look out my window. When I get frustrated with what I'm doing, I look out the window and I imagine the soldiers going through the burning woods trying to fight each other. And I say, this is why I'm doing this. They're telling me a story out my window, and this is why I do this. And that's why I implore people to to think that way and to understand its history is important. All right. So viewers, you'll want to join CVBT right away and get into the habit of being a member of this very great organization. Thank you, Tom. And thank you everyone for participating. And we're ready to take your questions.